friends, I'm Dr. Becky and welcome back to my channel and uh, welcome to Christmas with me as well because it's December now and I am home for Christmas and Christmas in the Smellers household, you know, I turn into like a veritable tiny Tim really as demonstrated by my Christmas jumper which gets better by the way, wait for it, oh it lights up as well, oh my god you have no idea how happy this makes me, it's like Disney Christmas and, and sort of electronic engineering dream but Never mind Christmas, it is December and there are things to see in the sky and things to talk about what has happened this month. So without further ado, let's get into this, let's get into December 2018's Sky News. So let's start with the planets that are still visible in the sky this month. So Venus is still incredibly bright in the pre-dawn sky, sort of in the southeast in the morning. Absolutely gorgeous. Mercury, as I said last month, is up there too, but it's sort of past its point of sort of furthest away from the sun in the sky, so it's getting lower each morning. But what you should look out for is December 21st, which is also the solstice, um, is when Jupiter is actually going to pass really close to Mercury as well. So Jupiter is currently on the rise, it's getting higher and higher each morning, and on December 21st, Mercury and Jupiter are going to be really, really close in the sky, along with Venus sort of higher up above them. And basically what you'll be able to see is sort of the smallest and the largest planet in the solar system very close to each other in the sky at the same time. Which, which is a spectacular sight for any morning really, but especially on the solstice after you've had the sort of longest night of the winter, at least in the northern hemisphere anyway, you're going to have a really late sunrise. And so even if you're not even up that early, you'll probably still be able to catch Jupiter, Mercury and Venus all in the sky at the same time. Then getting later in the month, Christmas Eve, the 24th. So uh, the Beehive Cluster, which is M44, really nice open cluster in the sky. You can spot it with your naked eye. It's in the constellation of Cancer, which is sort of next to Gemini, which is above Orion. Um, you should be able to find that quite easily. The moon is going to pass sort of straight over the Beehive Cluster and it's going to be almost full as well. So on the night of the 24th, Christmas Eve, I'm sure you'll be home, probably with a glass of sherry or something, putting out the mince pies for Father Christmas. Um, you should look up at sunset, see if you can first of all spot the Beehive Cluster in Cancer and then throughout the night as it gets later before you go to bed, watch as the moon moves across the sky and eventually passes in front of the Beehive Cluster so much that it's so bright that you actually won't be able to see the Beehive Cluster anymore either and then obviously the moon will move away from it again and you'll be able to spot it. Get some binoculars on it, see how many stars you can see, really really nice thing to look for especially on these long nights of December. Speaking of Christmas Eve as well, um, check out when the International Space Station is visible for you and your town because I know that in the UK it's going to be visible on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day morning as well, going overhead actually quite high. It's a fantastic sight to see because it's incredibly bright in the sky and it moves. You're sort of surprised at how fast it moves in the sky overhead, like it's clearly not a plane and it's clearly not a satellite either. So. That kind of thing, especially Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, could look like Father Christmas going over in his sleigh for any of you parents out there as well. Really nice thing to look out for. I'll put the link which can show you for your hometown, like what date and time and how far above the horizon it's visible uh, in the description below, so go check that out. And then after Christmas, I guess we've got to have something to look forward to in the new year. So one thing to look forward to is um, new moons coming early on in the year which is exciting because if you combine that with the really long nights around the solstice, then you're going to have really, really dark, long nights for observing. So hopefully the weather will hold out early in January and we'll be able to get outside and see some really, really dark nights for observing. Now this is going to be really important because there's another meteor shower coming up as well. It's the Quadrantus meteor shower. And if you're thinking, I've never heard of that constellation, that's because it doesn't exist anymore as a constellation. The radiant for this meteor shower is actually going to be sort of around about the handle of the Big Dipper or the plough and so it's going to be really high in the sky for people in the northern hemisphere and so it's going to be a really nice chance to spot some meteors. Kind of difficult to predict with this one how many you might end up seeing, you know, sort of predictions are about 50 to 100. Also, it's a very narrow peak with which you can see it. Like, it's not sort of a long, drawn-out thing over a couple of weeks, like some at the end of the year. This one is very much like 2 a.m. January 4th. If you don't go out sort of within that hour or so time slot, you're going to miss it. So if anybody is up late, 
early January, maybe you're back at work on night shifts, or maybe you're just extending the Christmas revelry period, I don't know, check out the Quadrantis Meteor Shower and see if you can spot some. And if you do, send me the pictures, because, you know, I always, always want to see you guys' pictures and see what kind of stargazing you've been up to. All right, let's come back down to Earth with a bump now and chat about everything that's been going on in the news in the past month. There's a lot. So, strap in, because we're here for a while. <laughs> So big news this month is that NASA's InSight probe actually landed on Mars. Um, for those of you who missed it, I did a vlog of the landing party that Oxford Physics had, which was great. We had some of the um, team scientists who work on the project in Oxford there as well, and it was like super tense. And we followed the landing because we had no idea if it was going to go right, but thankfully it landed safely on Mars. They got a ping back in an image pretty quickly as well which was great it's amazing that like we don't have to wait for these kind of things these days and with social media it's broadcast all around the world that oh hey we landed a probe on mars and within about half an hour here's an image of it which is pretty cool um since it landed on november 26th um it has since then sent back another couple of images sort of a selfie image that showed it on the surface of Mars. Um, it also sent one back showing that its solar panels had unfurled um, as they were supposed to as well. And obviously that's very important for it to get power so that its instruments can function because what it's trying to do is um, measure Mars quakes. So just like an earthquake, you know, what is going on in Mars's interior in terms of its core and, you know, its mantle and if there's any magma down there or causing earthquakes with tectonic plates shifting around just like on Earth as well. And the idea is that we eventually gain an understanding of how all of the inner planets in the solar system formed and how that's led to sort of their current uh, evolution and state in the solar system as well. The thing that I love about this though is that it also recorded the sound of the Martian wind. So it's got a pressure sensor on the actual lander and that pressure sensor picks up vibrations in the atmosphere. It can send back the vibrations and we can turn those into actual sound that we can then hear and so this is the recording that they got from that pressure sensor like it's really cool so they also like can bump it up a couple of octaves as well so if you didn't hear that then it might have been because you weren't using headphones but here's what it sounds like bumped up a couple of octaves it sounds like wind, right? I played it to my partner and he thought that it sounded like a heartbeat at first, which is also quite poetic, but it is Martian wind. I mean, it's been a really good month for space exploration because the next two things on my list are also uh, space exploration as well. So first of all, Voyager has left the solar system, which I love that. We should just change like Elvis has left the building to like Voyager has left the solar system. As this is Voyager 2, Voyager 1 already left the solar system in back in August 2012. Voyager 2 left at the beginning of December, but in a completely different part of the solar system. Different to Voyager 1 though is that Voyager 2's sensors were still working. So it had a sensor to detect cosmic rays and it had a sensor to detect the solar wind particles uh, from the sun that sort of mark the edge of where the solar system is. So the magnetic field of the sun sort of extends a certain distance away and it sort of binds sort of all the particles that have flown off the sun in the solar wind, the charged particles, um, into that sphere. So as soon as something crosses that boundary is when the particles in the solar wind count will drop and then also cosmic rays will increase because that magnetic field of the sun tends to deflect a lot of the high energy cosmic rays that come from interstellar space. And so both of those detectors detecting cosmic rays and the solar wind particles on Voyager 2 were both working. And when Voyager 1 left the solar system, only the cosmic ray detector was working. And so that was the only way that we knew it had left the solar system because those counts increased. This time we've seen those counts increase and we've seen the counts in the solar wind drop off. So we have actual measurements from the edge of the solar system of the sun's influence dropping off now from when Voyager 2 has actually left, which is pretty cool in my book. And so this is gonna let astronomers sort of better understand the influence of the sun and the extent of the sun as well. And so we're still learning stuff from Voyager, which launched over 40 years ago, which is kind of incredible. All right, next up is OSIRIS-REx arrived at Bennu. Now OSIRIS-REx stands for, and I have to write this down because I couldn't remember it off the top of my head. It stands for 
Origins, Spectral, Interpretation, Resource, Identification, Security, Regolith, Explorer. Yeah, that was a really lengthy name from NASA, but okay, we're going to go with it. <laughs> Basically, this was NASA's mission to send a space probe to an asteroid with the hope of eventually landing it one day on the asteroid, taking a sample and bringing that sample back to Earth. So this is a really exciting mission. So it, that's scheduled to return in about 2023, but obviously before it can come back, it has to get there. And so it arrives sort of in and around Bennu on December 3rd, 2018. And so in that time, what it did was it sort of fired its boosters in order to take it from sort of traveling to actually sort of in situ around Bennu and it's sort of in operations now it's not quite in orbit yet they're changing its orbit all the time but eventually it will settle into an orbit the idea is to um, image the surface in very minute detail and that will allow us them to pick a place on the surface to land uh, the sort of the best the flattest place possibly that it can land on the surface of Bennu. Currently though it's about 12 miles or 19 kilometers off the surface of Bennu doing this sort of survey of like the North Pole, the South Pole, the equator and all the regions of Bennu which is quite a small asteroid and the idea is to sort of get a better estimate of its mass and its density and its size and its composition just so again we can better understand sort of how the solar system as a whole has formed. So once it's finished that survey mode though it will sort of enter a proper orbit of Bennu on December 31st New Year's Eve and at that point it will become like the smallest body that's ever been orbited by a spacecraft at only something like 16,000 feet or like 500 meters across so this thing is pretty small. I mean it's only been there a matter of weeks though and it's already managed to find evidence of like surface water on Bennu like trapped in all the clay minerals that make up the surface. So the spacecraft has these things called spectrometers on board which uh, take the light that's reflected from the sun off Bennu, split it through a prism and you know you get its rainbow or spectra of light and then what they do is they look for missing colours or missing wavelengths of light in that spectra and those are absorption features from molecules in on the surface of Bennu and they've managed to find um, sort of oxygen and hydrogen containing compounds suggesting that water is there, these hydroxyl compounds, which is really, really cool that they've already managed to detect that in a matter of weeks. Bennu is too small to hold liquid water though, you know, it's not gravitationally strong enough to hold onto it, so these things are definitely locked in the minerals themselves rather than it hosting actual liquid water. And the main theory that's come out of this is that actually perhaps like a larger parent body that Bennu like broke off of in the formation perhaps you know sort of quite a large meteor smashed into a big lump of rock and that caused it to split apart maybe that larger body was actually capable of hosting water and did and then obviously Bennu got traces of that when it broke off so that's the theory that's come out of this discovery in the first couple of weeks of this mission which is I'm really excited for to see you know what it finds in the future and if it can actually get a sample back to us you know a couple of grams is what it's going to bring back but still that would be so exciting sticking with the solar system again and space exploration did you see the amazing images that have come from nasa's juno mission that's around jupiter at the minute so these were taken at the end of october when juno did sort of its close flyby with Jupiter sort of while it's in orbit around Jupiter but someone's processed them and NASA have released them at the beginning of this month and they are so detailed they are absolutely gorgeous but the really cool thing is that people have said that they can see a dolphin in the cloud structure on Jupiter. So Jupiter has all these amazing shapes and features on its surface because its atmosphere is incredibly turbulent so these bands are created by the fact that you have warm air rising and then as it sort of cools again it will sink again and so the lighter bands are called zones and that's where you've got the warm air rising up and then the darker areas are the places where the cool air is then falling again but you've then also got winds in each of those zones and bands and they're usually going in opposite directions as well so you have very strong wind blowing in opposite directions in two bands that are also of different temperatures and so the interactions you get between where those two sort of zones and bands meet means that you get incredibly turbulent interactions things like um kelvin helmholtz interactions as well and so you get these amazing shapes including things that look like dolphins 
which is pretty awesome. Um, does it beat Pizza Jupiter? Which is my favourite image of Jupiter. Probably not. Is it better than the Penguin Galaxy though? No. Not in my book. Nothing beats the Penguin Galaxy. Speaking of solar system exploration, still do not forget that New Horizons flyby of an asteroid is coming up on New Year's Day in January in 2019. So if you remember New Horizons a couple of years back did the amazing flyby of Pluto, we got those incredible images of Pluto and its moon and we found out so much information about the whole system, so much more than we had before, so much better images than we'd ever got using the Hubble Space Telescope of Pluto. So now it's on that flyby of Pluto, it's flying by this asteroid called Ultima Thule out in the Kuiper Belt. So an asteroid way out in the solar system uh, with the idea again of understanding how the solar system formed, how these icy bodies on the very edge of the solar system came to be as the sun was forming. And so I'm really excited to see what science comes out of that. So put it in your diaries because it's going to be a really quick flyby with a lot of science coming very, very quick and fast in those first 24 hours. So that'll be something to look forward to in the new year. And finally, something that is not solar system related this month. We've been doing really well with our solar system exploration, I have to say. But uh, four new gravitational wave detections have been announced by the LIGO and Virgo teams, which is really exciting. It brings the total of detections to 11. That's 10 black hole, black hole mergers and one neutron star, neutron star merger. So the four that have been announced, they were from back in 2017. So a detection in July and three in August, all of which were black hole, black hole merger events, which is really exciting. So LIGO and Virgo are basically these huge detectors. LIGO is two detectors in the US and Virgo is one in Europe. And basically what they are are these big L shapes and you've got mirrors sort of at the vertices of all of the L shapes. And what they do is they fire a laser down each of the sort of tunnels built underground down these L shapes. Uh, and they measure how long it takes the light to travel down the, the tunnel, bounce off the mirror and come back again. Uh, because you know how fast the speed of light is going, you can then get a very, very specific, very accurate measure of the distance of that tunnel that you've built underground. Um, you can know the distance of something like one ten thousandth of the diameter of a proton or something. Like, it's incredibly, incredibly precise. And you need that precision because when you have these black hole, black hole mergers, um, that puts gravitational waves into the sort of fabric of space-time that Einstein came up with. So you can imagine them physically rippling the space in between Earth and the black hole, black hole merger. And so when those gravitational waves get to Earth, it actually physically compresses and expands the distance, the actual physical distance in space between two objects. But those ripples are so, 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 so tiny by the time they get to Earth. And so you have to have something that is incredibly precise that can measure these incredibly small um, differences in um, the distance of an object. Obviously though, if there's an earthquake or some local disturbance, that is gonna cause the mirrors to shake underground and therefore you will sort of detect this change in distance, which is why you build more than one, because then you know that it's not a local disturbance, you know that it's come from somewhere in the universe and the three of them allow you to also triangulate the sort of direction that the signal came from as well, which was how they were able to find that optical counterpart to the one that was released last year as well. So really cool result that there's four more of them now. It means that you can start doing statistics on the population. Yes, there's still only 11, but 11 is better than one. And so they have started to do uh, those statistics now with this data, which is really exciting. It'll give us an idea though of how many uh, of these black holes form in the universe and how frequent these mergers of these objects are. And the next step for LIGO and Virgo is also, you know, they've detected black hole, black hole mergers, and they've detected neutron, neutron star merger. But what about a black hole merging with a neutron star? And so that's the next step. And it's kind of looks like that's what they're aiming for to discover next. So I guess watch this space for them announcing that discovery whenever it might be. I guess it's just a waiting game now. So that was everything for me this month. Like there was so much stuff that I didn't talk about this month, but I could have, we could have talked about the fact that Virgin Galactic got to space. There was a supernova in M77. We could have talked about the fact that the Parker Solar Probe is starting to send back its first bits of data as well. Hopefully another month we'll have a chance to talk about those because so much already happened this month as well. But I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you had fun listening to me chat 
and getting excited about um, solar system exploration because it's one of my favourite things. This is me clocking off now for Christmas. I'm going to have a little bit of a break, but I will be back in January with more videos. I hope to see you all there. Until then, ah, light up jumper! <laughs> Happy holidays, everybody. I hope you have a good one. Dr. Becky, over and out. Look at it flash, it's so cool! Oh my god, why am I still ill? Oh, it's so gross. Oh, freaking cold. Why? Why? And so the idea is that we'll eventually... Thanks, Mom! She's making my tea. She's too good for me. Tis the season to be jolly. Fa -la 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 -la. These sort of big L... Why can't I can't make an L? These big L shit. <laughs> there we go. Oh my god. Uh. <laughs> Merry Christmas to all and to all and good night.